Hi, everyone. We're just waiting a minute or two as people join and we'll get started momentarily. Would it be best to stay on mute till you call on us or? Sure. And for those of you just joining, we will get started in a minute as people are getting admitted from the waiting room. So welcome everyone to this event. We are delighted to have you here, even if we can't see you and we'll be able to take your questions. So be sure you type those in the Q&A box as we get started. Um, I am so thrilled that Harris is able to host this event because this speaks to one of the premier issues of our day in the city on top of the COVID pandemic with which so many people are struggling, the economic inequalities that are being laid bare by the recession accompanying COVID crisis, and then the real inequality in safety and the risk that so many of our citizens face every day. Harris is committed to civic engagement around the city and to partnering between academics, policymakers, stakeholders, the local community to come up with innovative solutions to the most troubling problems that our cities face. And the work being done by CRED is such a fantastic example of innovation really improving people's lives. And the need for this kind of partnership is so pressing. So I'm really excited to hear what our speakers are gonna to have to say today. I am going to save introductions of the individuals because uh, Dan is going to do that, so I'll introduce Dan, but I want to just note that Arnie is one of our distinguished fellows at the Harris School and a Hyde Park native who has gone on to leadership in the Chicago Public Schools, of the Department of Education at local and national levels, and so we're really lucky to have him as part of our Harris community as well as part of our greater Chicago community. So now let me introduce Dan Tangerlini, who is an MPP graduate from the Harris School. I won't say the year, I'll leave that to you. Um, but it's, it's really uh, wonderful to have alums who have had such an impact in the philanthropic sector, as well as the government sector at local and national levels. Dan's currently the chief financial officer of the Emerson Collective, which is a philanthropy dedicated to removing barriers to opportunity so that people can live their most full lives. And that's something that I think that that partnership between philanthropy and stakeholders is something that's needed more now than ever in solving these problems. But Dan also has brought that same ethic to his work with government where he was administer administrator of the GSA under President Obama has also worked in the Department of the Treasury and uh, with DC local government and Department of Transportation there. So Dan's work really spans multiple areas and he's taken multiple vantage points in making a difference in the world. So we're very proud to call him a Harris alum. And I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Dan to introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Baker. And I really appreciate that very generous introduction. My job is very simple here. My job is simply to introduce uh, the moderator tonight, uh, uh, Arnie Duncan, and then the members of the panel that he's gonna discuss their important work with. As I was thinking about this momentary star turn, because how often do you get to introduce someone like Arnie Duncan? I was trying to think about some of the connections and intersections that Arnie have. Uh, uh, Dean Baker, you pointed out uh, a couple of them. Arnie and I both have the good fortune of, uh, of serving with the Emerson Collective. Uh, that's one. The second was both Arnie and I uh, did have uh, the honor of serving in the Obama administration. Um, and I, uh, I, I looked up to Arnie in multiple ways in, in, in his role as the Secretary of Education uh, and did some work uh, in service of that department as the GSA Administrator. Um, uh, Arnie and I um, also, as you pointed out, had the good fortune of gaining some of our education uh, right on the U Chicago campus, Arnie at the lab school and me both in the college and in the Harris School. I had the good fortune. I'm going to give away my age by saying I was the second graduating class from the Harris School after it received its name. But now things get a little more intimate. It turns out Arnie is actually the name of my oldest brother and my Danish grandfather. Um, uh, but more importantly, I think the most important connection is 
uh, the how how long I've admired Arnie for his leadership, his passion, his humanity, and his dedication. And it's frankly those qualities that when you combine with the um, uh, when when you combine it with the concepts and the theories that you learn in a school like the Harris School, allow you to come up with interventions, uh, actions, and policies, much like Arnie's work uh, with Chicago Cred, that have meaningful influence and impact on people's lives. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Arnie Duncan, who is actually also a distinguished fellow at my alma mater, and, um, and Wendy Jones, who's the executive director of the Youth Peace Center of Roseland, and Jason uh, Javon Hicks, who's a life coach with that same Youth uh, Peace Center. To discuss, to discuss uh, how we can rethink policing and how we can how we can find new ways of combating violence within our our urban centers. Arnie, Dan, so good to see you, and thanks so much for a really really kind introduction. It's been a you know amazing run working with you and learning from you and seeing you know the heart that I have for Chicago. You have that same heart for DC and knowing the impact you've had there and continue to try and have to make DC a the best city possible. And Dean, thank you so much for the, for the opportunity. And we'll, we'll make this, um, we're always very informal. We'll just sort of have a conversation for, you know, maybe 20, 25 minutes, trying to give you a sense for our work. And then um, we'll just open up for questions. So feel free to shoot them to us in the chat and we'll try and answer them as best we can. And really just, uh, you know, I'd much rather have a, have a good conversation than a long lecture dialogue. I'll also just say up front that unfortunately my family and I are battling COVID right now. So please, please stay safe. and. I'm sort of drinking throughout this thing, just trying to uh, stay hydrated here. And we're all, we're all getting better, but it, it honestly hasn't been, been too much fun. But let me sort of explain why we're focused and it's all personal. So I'll just speak for myself first, sort of why I chose to come back to Chicago and focus on, on gun violence, on what we've learned in the four years of our work, on where we are now, why the leadership of, of Mrs. Jones and her husband and Mr. Hicks and their team is so extraordinarily important. And obviously, this is a, a group with a deep interest in public policy. What are the, some of the potential implications of what we learned over the four years for trying to make our city a much safer place? Let me start with, for myself, just sort of the, the why I do this. Um, unfortunately, gun violence is not a, a new issue to me. I started losing friends to gun violence when I was a, a teenager growing up. I was playing basketball throughout the South and West Sides and had a series of older guys that sort of Help, help protect me and would help give me sort of safe passage in and out of neighborhoods. And when you start to lose friends at that age and don't quite know how to uh, express it or handle it, I think it, it, it shapes you and honestly probably scars you in some ways that are, are difficult to, to talk about. Fast forward to uh, about 25 years after that, uh, maybe 20 years after that, to when I led the Chicago public schools for seven and a half years and happy to talk about successes, happy to talk about things I'm proud of and, and you know, things that went well. But on my watch during my seven and a half years, on average, we had a student killed every two weeks due to gun violence. It was a staggering rate of loss. And thank God, goodness, it was we never lost a child in a school, but it was you know, on the bus on the way home, walking to the corner store, you know, 7.30 in the morning on a school day, getting ready to go to school and shot through a living room, living room window you know, by an AK-47 from 100 yards away. And at that time, my wife and I had two young kids and for me, 99% of the time, meeting families, meeting parents after they had just lost their son or daughter, that was by far the hardest part of my job. Nothing else came close. And everything that's supposed to be hard, academic achievement, you know, labor management stuff, budgets, operations, you name it, um, all of that was, was on a relative basis infinitely easier than dealing with this loss of life. And in hindsight, very, very naively, when my family and I left to go uh, serve the Obama administration in 2009, I really thought Chicago was at rock bottom. I thought things couldn't get any worse here. And again, that was unfortunately dead wrong. And for a whole host of reasons, which we can get into, things got a lot worse in the seven years that, that our family was, was gone. And so for me, coming back home to Chicago in, uh, in 2016, this city had given me every opportunity, educationally, culturally, socially, athletically, for me to come home and not try and work on this wouldn't have felt right. And I often say that we're motivated by our successes, but we're haunted by our failures. And I don't think, I know that we as adults, we as parents, we as leaders 
failed to keep our children on the south and west sides safe. So I wanted to try and try and work on that. What's the context is important to understand uh, relative to, to New York and LA. Uh, Chicago is about six times more violent than New York, not 6%, not 60%, but 600% more violent than New York. We're three to four times more violent than, than LA. People often say, well, maybe you need more police. Uh, we actually have twice as many police per citizen as LA. We have about the same number of police, almost identical uh, compared to New York. So here in Chicago, more police has not led to, to more safety. Um, we have strict gun laws here in Chicago. I'm, I'm sort of vehemently anti-gun. I'd love to get rid of them all if I could. Don't really have that power. But I always say Chicago um, is an island. We don't have a moat around us. And guns pour into us from Indiana, which is you know, 30 minutes south of us that, that live here in Hyde, Hyde Park. And so just thinking as a private citizen coming out of government, um, couldn't get rid of our guns. Very few crimes get solved here uh, in Chicago. There's something called the clear rate that I'm obsessed with. That's the percent of crimes that get solved. The clear rate for homicides is about 17%. So that means 83% of times when you take someone's life here in Chicago, you literally, not figuratively, you literally get away with murder. And so much of the violence is driven by retaliation, by street justice. If you feel you're not getting justice from the traditional legal means, uh, legal systems, then you, then you take justice into your, into your own hands. And so I couldn't figure out how to get rid of the guns, didn't know how to rebuild trust between the police and, and the community, although we are working on that and we work with some amazing individual police officers and happy to talk about that. So the only thing I could think to do was to try and uh, give the guys a reason to put down the guns, to give them some hope and to help them sort of transition to a different life. I thought that was possible to do from the private side. So we started about four years ago, working with 30 guys in, in Rosen, which is where Mr. Mrs. Jones and Mr. Hicks both work and live. Um, many of that first group of guys we, we uh, worked with came from the Youth Peace Center, from the center that Mrs. Jones and her husband uh, started. We've grown over the past four years. We work with young men, both in Rosen and in North Lawndale. We also fund a number of community partners to do this. We don't want to build a Chicago Cred Army, we really want to empower those local leaders who have been doing this work for 20, 30, 40 years to grow and build their capacity. And the first three years, 2017, 2018, 2019, we saw double digit reductions in violence and homicides each year. So we felt you know, good about that progress. Uh, starting this year, our goal for 2020 was to get below 400 homicides. That's what, that's what our ambition was. And that's still way too many. This is a crazy thing to say, but unfortunately it's the truth. We have not been below 400 homicides since 1965. It's been 55 years here in Chicago. So that was our goal. Uh, but the year started really tough. January was tough. February was tough. Um, COVID hit. Things got even tougher uh, here in the city. We, we tracked the data relentlessly, you know, by neighborhood every day, every week. We saw early on a spike in armed robberies and Unfortunately, here in Chicago, everybody's armed. So, you know, armed robberies lead to shootings on both sides. So we saw that starting to spike. And then subsequent to George Floyd's murder, that was the toughest time of our four years of work. In those six or eight weeks after that, um, it was, it's almost like a blur. We had one of our outreach workers, unfortunately, killed. Um, we had three of our young men, unfortunately, killed. We had the 20 month old son, the, the baby son of one of our participants killed in a car seat at going to the laundromat with his, uh, with his mother. And it was just a staggering rate of loss. And things have gotten you know, somewhat better from that, that point. But again, that was by far the, the toughest time we've experienced as a, as a team. I hope, I hope to God we never go through anything like that again. But year to date, violence this year, rather than going down and getting below 400 homicides, is a city we're up about 51%. It's a huge spike in violence. And we're in danger of giving back all the gains that we made in 2017, 2018, and 2019. We'll see, see how we're able to close out the, you know, these last six weeks of, of the year. What was very interesting to me that at a time when violence across the city was spiking, and violence in Chicago is highly concentrated by neighborhood. We have 15 neighborhoods on the south and west sides that produce 80% of the violence. The time where violence is spiking everywhere in Roseland, uh, where the Youth Peace Center is, where we started our work, where we are, have the deepest relationships, we've worked with the most number of men, 
over 310 in the four years, violence is actually down about a third. So the city up 51%, uh, Rosen down about 33%. And let me be clear, it's still too high in Rosen. Um, we had two shootings there you know, yesterday that we were dealing with and, and you know, it's, it's never good enough. Um, but there was something very, very different happening in Rosen that wasn't happening in the rest of the city. And so I started to talk more publicly about this starting about the middle of the year and I've continued to do that because the public policy implications, I think, are very, very significant. The final point I'll make, and we can sort of get into this in conversation, is there's lots of talk about you know, defunding the police. And that's a, that's a, you know, a complicated or loaded term, but there, there are other ways of talking about it. I talk about reimagining the police or reinventing the police. And it's very, again, interesting here in Chicago that funding for the violence prevention work that so many of us, so many of us are trying to do there's very little public funding for that, even though it's a public good. And for every dollar that's spent on violence prevention, we spend $150 on police. So the question I've started to sort of raise publicly is could we think about reimagining that? And could rather than you know, less than a penny on every dollar go to violence prevention, could maybe call it a nickel, call it a dime, could some percent of those resources go to violence prevention that actually leads to increased public safety? We spend privately about $10 million a year in Roseland. The, the, the you know, rough back of the envelope math is if you know, 10 million per neighborhood, 15 highly violent neighborhoods, that's about $150 million per year. Call it 200 million because some neighborhoods are bigger and have more guys need to reach like, like Austin and you know, Garfield Park and others. But as a city, as a county, as a state, with a new administration and in, in you know, in federal leadership, can we think about a public investment that would allow us to see the kinds of reductions in violence um, throughout the other 14 neighborhoods that we've seen in Rosen? If we do that, we could lead Chicago to, again, a radically safer place, a place we haven't seen in more than 50 years now. So that's the, that's the policy part of the conversation we can, we can get into. But I'm going to stop there and just really have a conversation with, with Mrs. Jones and Mr. Hicks, because I really want you to understand not the theory of this work, but the practicality of this work. What does it mean? What does it take? And so, Mrs. Jones, I want to start with you. Just pick any one of the, the many, many guys you and your husband team work with. Just put a, you know, without using a name, just put a picture in your mind and just give the folks listening just a little sense of what that young man's lived experience has been. Uh, prior to him coming into our, our program and in our work? Sure, two come to mind immediately, but I think I'll just draw off the young man who came by our center this afternoon, uh, someone who um, came to us who was really strung out on drugs, um, involved in gang activity, had a horrible social media um, presence and um, I could go on and on. And, um, you know, he came in uh, with a slim hope of, you know, changing uh, the direction of his life, but maybe not really fully uh, being engaged uh, initially. But that young man today came back with a lot of love in his heart. Um, unbelievably, uh, youth, uh, I'm sorry, Chicago Cred, connected him, well, after going through the program, which includes outreach, which includes uh, programming, which inc uh, includes great life coaching and then employment and training, he was connected to an opportunity to work with um, into in a union apprenticeship program in painting. And so he has been doing this. He told us today he's 66 months in without missing a day of work. And, the, and to be a full apprentice uh, or to finish the apprenticeship program, you have to go 125 months or weeks. One of those, I don't remember exactly, but the bottom line is that he's halfway there. Here's a young man who was barely getting up uh, to do anything before 12 noon. And he is 100% uh, on his job and very close to being a um, union painter and went from uh, working in the illegal economy to working in a legal economy. And he's making probably, I think he said $30, $37 uh, 
an hour, which is amazing uh, for him just a short time ago. So um, when, when I look at him, I mean, he, he renews my energy, my, my motivation. He just renewed every uh, ounce of what we do this work for. Uh, there's hope. We see hope in him and he sees hope in himself and in others. And uh, that's really what it's all about. And, and just imagine just uh, having served 30, 30 guys and each one of them have a story like that. So the, the epiphany that I had early on, which shows I'm not very smart, was that if you want to stop shooting, you have to, you have to work with shooters. And so we work only with the young men and some young women most likely to shoot and, and be shot on the south and west sides. But you say something all the time, Mrs. Jones, that I know we believe in your heart, and I do as well, but it's pretty profound that with all the guys you work with, all that they have done to the community, what has happened, what has happened to them, you don't think we've worked with a bad guy yet. And explain Absolutely. to the group, explain to the group what you mean by that. Well, you know, um, I'll go back a little bit. My background is uh, a Chicago, I was formerly a Chicago public school teacher. And, uh, and in that work, I really only worked with young children. My husband had a background of working with uh, older youth and young adults in uh, a suburban courthouse. Uh, but we came together and started working together about 15 years ago. And so I agreed to work with older young people, a little hesitant about it, but just one day in uh, of just sitting around and talking to young people, I really fell in love. And it's so very true, no matter what our young men come, the background they come in with, um, I don't see any of that in them. I think they just really wanna be heard. Uh, they wanna do the same thing all of our children and grandchildren wanna do. They just want an opportunity and some hope. And those are some of the things that they have not received. And so um, through our program and through Chicago, Craig, all of these young people are seeing a glimpse of hope. And um, they're just good guys, uh, need to be led a little bit, need to have some people in their corner. Um, we all know that when you have strong protective factors, uh, the young person that you're working with is more likely to do well. And so what we do at the Youth Peace Center and with Chicago Craig, we build protective factors around our young people and give them an opportunity to really excel and to change their lives. There are a bunch of different components of our program. We have a street outreach team that is really like our HR function, guys who have, and guys again and women who have what we call LTO, License to Operate, who have trust and credibility on the street to recruit guys into our program. Once they come in, one of the first things we do is max, match them with life coaches. And we always say experience can be the best teacher, but it doesn't have to be your own experience. You can learn from the experience of others. And Mr. Hicks, you're one of our extraordinary life coaches. And if you could try and give folks a little bit of a sense of what the heck does that mean? What's the job of a life coach? What are you trying to do every day? Um, thanks, Ani. So, so again, um, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, so just, just, just in a nutshell, uh, I, I thought about this the other day, right? I've been asked this question for the last three years. To me, to be a life coach is to make sure this young young man we servicing, right, has all the good things to say about you, right? So that means you you got to assist him, you got to you got to help mentor him, you got to help guide, you got to build a relationship. But as far as building a relationship, you have to understand it's time is a time for you to speak, and it's a time for them to speak. In order to build a firm relationship, you got to be able to be a, a hell of a listener. Right. You got to listen. You got to learn. And you also got to see within what this individual is telling you. Um, to me, being a life coach is, is is almost like rearing a child. You 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 get child that people, individuals that's been homeless, uh, been abused. Um, and then as far as the violence go, we deal with that all the time. But I just think as far as being a life coach, um, there's no limits. Um, there's no time span. Um, you know, they say we have off days, but, but to me, you know, a Sunday night can be a critical night where individual call, you have to be able to respond, um, and respond correctly. A life coach is also about knowing when it's not your battle, when you can't fight the battle with them alone, you need to get some help yourself. Um, that's why I call him Miss Jones or Mr. Jones or one of my lead life coach or one of the other life coaches to help assist me in, but, um, a life coach, I, I can go for hours as far as what his job is i think think just to kill it in a nutshell it's about assisting this individual and his every need and helping them um complete the goals that he set um in his life 
And every guy is different. Every situation is different. Guys change over time. So it's a hard question. But Mr. Higgs, what would you say if there's like the most important thing that you're trying to instill in our young men, the most important lesson, what would that be? Accountability. Being accountable for your actions. Explain. Explain. Um, so so um, again, um, we're not perfect. Um, I, I've come from this background. Um, just to be clear, um, I've walked these streets. I've, I've dealt with these same battles. I'm still living within Roseland. I've been here 43 years. Um, to explain what I'm saying, it, it's all about... Um, so I'll just give you a quick example. I'm, I'll just do an example. You know, you know individuals come to us with, with serious issues, right? Real serious issues. But in order to deal with these issues, you have to be in not only hear the issues, but you got to understand. A lot of times we listen, but we don't understand what's being said to us. And that's why CBI is so important and motivational interviewing is so important because it gives you the opportunity to learn and reflect on what you're being told, right? And what's being said to you. Then you're able to serve these individuals directly how they need to be serviced, right? So if a person needs housing, and it's a little different from safety. We got a lot, of, we, we deal with a lot of shooters. We deal with people that's been shot. Um, again, people that's been abused, but each, each individual is different. So the, the key to it is understanding exactly the approach this young man is coming to you or this young woman is coming to you with, and you're able to service him a little bit better. Once you open up the best relationship with them, um, they'll open up to you and then you'll know how to service them with their needs. So much richness in what you guys are saying. I think one of the things that I continue to learn is not to judge. And we live in a world of tremendous gray. There's very little black and white in our world. And there's, I think, a myth of good guys and bad guys. And Mrs. Jones sort of talks about there aren't any bad guys. And it's just guys that need some, some hope and some love and some opportunity. And, you know, Mr. Hicks, you alluded to it, but maybe just for the group to sort of just honestly say that, you know, on, on paper, theoretically, for a, a large part of your life, you were technically one of those bad guys. You were in and out of jail. You were, you know, carried a gun. You've talked about the intoxicating power of, of, of having a gun. So maybe just explain for folks where that's a, a foreign world, where they really don't understand that, what that feels like to, to, uh, to carry a gun and what, is that, what does that power do to you? Okay, so first of all, I always lived off the thing, don't judge a book by its cover. Um, you know, guys, it, it, it's in the, in the, in the, and I'm just going to speak of roles. Just roles in the community of roles and where I was born and raised. And, and my trials and tribulations came from. So, so dealing with guns as as I was coming up is the same as I see as I'm being a mentor and a life coach. Um, it's a feel of necessity. It's a feel of empowerment. It's a need. Um, let's let's keep in mind, city of, city of Chicago, the South Side of Chicago, since I can remember, has been raised off retaliation is a must, right? We don't we don't get picked on. A beat up, jumped on, and we don't do nothing about it. It's just, it's just the norm, right? It's just the norm. It's how we raised. For me, being a forty three old uh, young young black man, still from Chicago, Illinois, still living, right, growing up. But the empowerment of a gun before people criticize and judge, you need to understand, right? Let's just understand. We see the news, we see this, we see that, um, we see about what the police doing, all it. It's not, it's not about that. First and foremost, it's about engaging this individual and, and, and getting an understanding of why he has this gun, why he's shooting. And, 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 it, and it always trickles down to a domino effect from years to past, right? We're dealing with young men who's at the most 25 years old on average, 25 to 27, and on down to 18, 19, 17, 18, 19, right? We have guys that's barely 20 years old that's battling than fuse that's been going on for the last 18 years, meaning they were two years old. There were two when it's actual beef that they're repping right now started. So it's, 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 it's a little bit more to it than what you may see. And, and, and I, like I say, always, every, every individual we deal with has a story, right? And, and I'm starting to agree with Ms. Jones. At first I thought where well, every person ain't, no, ain't a bad person we deal with. But, but I think it's more so if these guys are willing to come in and ask for help and ask for services, I don't care what society thinks. Right? Oh, he's a monster. He's this. What you don't know is this young man crying out for help. And he don't know no other way to do it. But oh, I heard about this Chicago Cred program that's going on at the Youth Peace Center. He's heard this for the last few years, right? This goes back to 2016, 2017. So it trickles down to guys say, well, if I want to make the change, I got a door I can go into, 
right? Which is Chicago cred, right? We train them. We, we're doing whatever we can do for them. But in order to do that, you got to understand that just because he's been uh, uh, allegedly said he has a gun or committed a crime with a gun, let's, let's figure out why before we start to finger pointing and assuming we know what's going on. And talk about the addictive power of having a gun. <laughs> so, this, so again, um, I, even even when I get asked this, it, it, it's so so I'm, so let me let me be clear, right? So I've been I've been removed from from the streets, right? I come home 2016, 2015 October. I was given the opportunity um, to interview for this job, right? And I think this was April of 2017. I began working April 2017. Every time I hear gunshots, right, I flash back. No matter how many trains I've been through, no matter how straight I've been, I'm removed, self-differentiation. I'm not hanging with my old crew. I'm not recruiting. I'm not game banging. I'm not throwing up pistols. I'm not doing none of that. But every time, even now, through all the trainers, all the therapy I didn't had, even now when I hear gunshots, my immediate reaction is defense. Right. So you can imagine what these young men are thinking about, right? When they really out here in these streets and they these gunshots going off, it's 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 all about redirecting, right? We want to talk about the direction they go in. If we see they have a problem, let's do all we can to redirect them. And I and I think and and not to toot my horn, I feel like I'm best when it comes to a lot of the street, the street issues we have. I feel like I'm best because I levitate to that. Because I know what it took for me to stop. And I know some of the theories I went through and some of the, the trials and tribulations I had to go through, I could prevent some of these young men from going through if I can get that best relationship with them. Once I get that relationship with them, it's all downhill or uphill from there, depending on, on which route we're going in. And Mrs. Jones, I haven't asked you this one before, but you know, Mr. Hicks was basically recently out of jail, been out of, in and out of jail for years, sort of a long history of, of different stuff. And you decide to hire him to be a life coach. <laughs> <laughs> what did you see in him? What made you take, I'll say it, what made you take that risk? Mm. What did, what could he bring to the table that you felt that you needed to be successful? I really think that Javon just answered the question for us. As I was sitting here listening to him, I'm beaming with, you know, pride, you know, that Javon is, is like a secret weapon. And he's like, um, you know, an intelligence person. Um, I really look to him uh, for um, the, you know, the actual street activity. He knows it, he keeps a pulse on it. He, I mean, and when he says seven days a week, 24 hours a day, he means it. I mean, there's not a day or time that I can call uh, Hicks and he won't respond and he has information for me. I value his work and he's a great access to our team. How did he, how did it come about? Actually, his brother worked for me in another program. And I reached out to his brother to come and work for us in this position. He had moved to Arizona and he said, you have to, you have to talk to my brother, Javon, he's, he's the man. And so I um, had a couple of conversations with Javon. I didn't know him because as he's mentioned earlier, he was in and out of jail. And although I am a longtime resident of uh, the Roseland community as well, I knew his brother. His brother was, uh, was working in the same um, field as I. I didn't know Javon, but it, I brought him in in another program prior to starting with Chicago Grid. And he showed himself uh, at that time. Uh, he's great. He's, uh, he really loves the work that he does. He's committed and he really wants to help young people change their life before they go down the same road that he has taken. And if they've already are there or halfway there, he's always trying to redirect their paths. I'm very proud to have him on my team. When we talk about, you know, technically your job is life coach and you're pretty modest, you wouldn't say this, but most nights you're out there with a the street outreach team. That's not in your job description. Nobody asks you to do that. I see you out there all the time. Why, why are you out there night after night with street outreach? Initial contact. It's like football. I got to make this tackle. I got to make this sack. I got to say this game. I got to. Because the one thing people don't understand about, and, and, and I was going to mention this, outreach is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world, in Chicago for sure, right? I compare it to a fireman going into a five-alarm fire 
and trying to come out without smelling like smoke. It's not going to happen, right? These guys out here every day, no vests, no radio, no bags, no cuffs, none of this, right? All they're going off is their credibility, they heart, they soul, and, and they desire, desire to help the community change, right? And so when I see that and I think to myself, like, uh, why would I be sitting down? as a life coach, just, just being honest, why would I be sitting down when I'm gonna have to deal with these individuals they engaging within the next two to three months or, 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 or so have you once they engage in bringing them program, I think that initial contact with them, it makes it a little bit easier or a lot bit easier once I get them engaged into the programming phase. Um, and, and, I, and I just can't see myself doing it no other way. I recommend all the other coaches, um, to come out and they've been coming out lately. Um, it, it's just the thing. It's always about teamwork too. Right, because we we all still work the same our same model, stop the violence, uh, reduce gun violence in a transformative way, and save some of these senseless lives that's being lost. Now, final quick question for both of you, and then we'll open it up. I know we're getting a bunch of questions in the queue, so I'll try and go through those or summarize them as best I can and, and do those next. But Mrs. Jones, for both you guys, this is not theoretical. You know, I'm in Roseland, I'm in North Lawndale, I'm wherever, but then I come home to, to High Park, which is relatively safe. Um, you live in Roseland. You've had shootings on your block. Mr. Jones, you've had shootings next door. Why do you do this work? Well, we're, we're losing our sons, our daughters. We're, we're, we're losing innocent children and babies, and um, we're, we're losing our communities. And um, being a longtime resident, I know what this community looked like uh, years ago. And it was a safe place. And it, they, we had good schools, and there were opportunities. We had resources and services and and we're losing all of that we're losing this and um you know just being a, a resident being a mother of four sons myself i feel like i have a responsibility you know and my responsibility may not look like the person's responsibility next door but we all have a responsibility you know to 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 save our children and to save our communities and in a nutshell, that is truly why I, I do the work. I, I love our people. Um, I love all people. People have a right to live in a safe community anywhere. And um, I really, it's just, you know, personal to me to uh, be able to have uh, young men just take a new look uh, through a new lens at uh, what the community was, what the community can be, and how they can contribute as, as um, productive citizens in it. Same question for you, Mr. Hicks, and I'll just add a further complication for you. This isn't just home. These are streets where you have a history and the streets, you know, don't always forget things. And what does it feel like to do this work, you know, in your home, place you were born and raised, um, but also place that doesn't forget oh, some so, of the things um, that you did um, in the past? Yeah, so, so great question. Um, I, don't, I don't think I can ever come up with one answer, but I do know for a fact the reason why I took a chance, it, it was a chance with me, right? Because even though Ms. Jones, they, they believed in me, they gave me an opportunity. I've been successful with doing that. It's always been a chance with me for someone that's had a past issue with me um, to do whatever, right? Let, let's say retaliate, let's, let's get them back for this. Um, it's another reason why I go out with outreach. This has been my white flag, right? For the last four years plus, it's been my white flag. If I can't tell it to you, I'm gonna show it to you. I quit. I'm not. I'm not into that no more. Um, I don't have. I don't have in, any desire to do it no more. Um, and I think guys respect me because I was never quote unquote what we call a, a snake and just did things just to do it. Um, and guys kind of respect it, and I still respect guys too as well. Um, and, and again, I I do this work because therapeutically it keeps me sane. Right? It keeps me sane. Again, like I said. When I hear shots, I react back to what I used to think about, like what's going on. But when I think about it right now and I say, man, um, I've been going four years plus without not one issue with law enforcement, um, a traffic ticket, nothing, right? But these guys still respect, they love me, they engage in me. I feel it's authentic. And, and to be honest with you, I'm not gonna stop doing it because I know I made my mama grow a lot of gray hairs, put her through a lot of trials and tribulations from houses being raided, um, um, bond money, all this thing, this is, a, this is a young man with no money. I'm doing all this, right? I'm coming up with guns just as, as, as quick as somebody can come up with a bag of candy, easily. Um, 
Could I have stopped? Yeah, I could, I could have done a lot of things different, right? People always say it was the parent. Let me be, let me be real clear to everyone, everybody watching. Um, I was a schoolboy. I played baseball, Jackie Robinson West, went to Harlem High School. Mom used to drop me off every day. But after a certain while, what she didn't know is once she dropped me off, I got right back on the bus and went right back to the hood and started doing other things. So it ain't always about a parent. A parent can't see everything. It's about the people that are seeing things that can inform their parents and say, hey, look, I sent your son, or I think your son is this. A lot of times we just so quiet about things. It's not about snitching, uh, uh, ratting, talking. It's about each one teach one, right? And that's what I feel right now. Every day, no matter what individual doing, I'm going to try and help them, right? Because I push my help away. I didn't have to be in this position. I probably would have never met any of you, right? I pushed my help away, but guess what? God worked so great for me. I feel so good no matter what nobody think about me. I'm looking on this screen talking proud right now. I feel so good. I finally got a business card in my life that means something. I can pass to somebody and say, hey, give me a call if you know somebody needs some help. That's all I ever asked for. And so I'm not going to stop. It's nothing can stop me from helping Rosen at all, nothing, right? And I'm going to continue to do that every day, all day and and, and and to it's my time is up until it's time to pass the torch on we have about 50 minutes left so i'll try and get to some of the many questions you guys are asking we'll try and shorten answers but mrs jones there's a question um we're trying to do again quicker answers about what does a bad social media presence mean so explain how <laughs> social media drives the violence here in chicago yes i can um when we, well, we do media checks on all of our guys and in order for them to be able to move on to another phase, they have to have a clean social media present. Um, for example, a, a participant, um, maybe prior to coming or a person who's taking a little longer to understand uh, may have on his Facebook page, uh, pictures of himself that are posted that has uh, hundreds of dollars on the bed maybe drug paraphernalia, maybe even guns. That's a bad social media present in a nutshell. Mr. Hicks, there's a question about what do we do when, when guys you know, uh, might get into it with each other, different groups and roles. And we've had that, we've had guys that have not just shot at each other in the past, but have actually hit, hit each other, wounded each other. How do we deal with those kinds of situations and explain sort of how hyper-local the violence is in Chicago. This is not South Side versus West Side. This is not Black versus Latino. You know, this is 103rd Street against you know, 107th Street, unfortunately. But explain how we work through those situations where guys in our program were actively trying to take each other's lives. Okay, so cool, great question, right? Okay, so so right now I'm, I'm currently employed working from the Youth Peace Center Rosen. We have our set of guys, right? Our set of individual participants Right. And then we have the 95th Street location. Right. So these guys, quote unquote, they don't get along. Right. So the first first thing we find out if, if guys that's together and they harm to each other, it's called action steps. Right. We reach out to outreach workers. Right. We get on top of social media. Again, again social media is the key. Right. And th this can answer your question alone. If you're not on top of social media, then we lose it. I'm going to say this again. If you're not on top of social media, you are losing the battle already, no matter how much you do in the field, right? You have to be on top of social media. So again, to answer that question, it's all about teamwork. It's no one man can win this show. You ha have to be able to have the relationship with your coworkers, right? It's beyond the participant. I, I need to be able to call a Charlie Wally or, 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 or Mike and, and, these, and, and, and Terrence and say, hey, look, I have an issue as a life coach. Even though I'm out in the field with them sometimes, or well, most of the times, three to four days out the week, I'm out in the field with them. But I still need to be able to, another life coach be, need to be able to call and say, hey, look, this is how you meet them on the front end. You got a front end to violence and you have a back end. Our job is to catch it on the front end. Back end is more like violence. When you catch it on the front end, we have to take these guys to barbecues or take these guys out, let them have a good time and see it's something different besides shooting the gun at each other from two blocks away or across the street from each other. And then once they start engaging with you, you'll be surprised how guys say, you know what? It wasn't even worth it. Mm -hmm. I've got plenty of pictures. I got plenty of videos. When we done took guys from New York to, to San Antonio, LA, it, it don't matter where you take, but you got to be able to show these guys something different. And, and ironically it's helped me seeing I've never been out the city of Chicago in my life or the state of Illinois until I started working for Chicago Crib. And I want to thank y'all for that. And I tell Mr. Jones all the time, I'm scared of flights, planes, 
but I still made those trips and those journeys and it made me so much of a different person. So I'm with instilling these other guys a little dedication, determination, and discipline. So therefore, they'll be able to overlook a little small conflict when we be able to come to the table, sit down, have a little meal, talk about it, guys, shake hands. We got a non-aggression agreement. We sit out here in these streets where guys sign before you become a part of this program, uh, uh, real quick, we have what we call a non-aggression agreement, right? Meaning you have to commit to saying neither, neither myself nor my clique or my crew us going to go to the other side and do anything. And once you get that established three, between some, some key individuals and some guys who are really authentic, that's going to knock the violence down itself. And so that's what we strive for, pushing for that non-aggression agreement, building the best relationships, and, and staying on top of social media. Mrs. Jones, you made a comment about protective factors. And there's a question, what do you mean by protective factors? What are protective factors? Yeah. So. Um they're the things that uh, help a child understand that they have a support network. Um, a lot of times we have young people that come from very dysfunctional family. Maybe they don't have that parental support uh, at home. That's a protective fire factor. If you have a parent that's engaged in your life, that's a protective factor. When you are attached to the Youth Peace Center and you have four or five mentors that you are in relationship with, that's a protective factor. And it goes on and on. Being connected to resources and services, all of those things are protective factors. And a lot of times I'll say that in communities, there are some resources, but when a young person can't be connected or don't know how to connect themselves, then they are without the protective factors that they need to feel uh, that they can excel and be successful at what they do. I, if I may, I also want to double back to the uh, social media ad, um, question as it relates to um, the presence. So, you know, uh, we have a, uh, we've had a number of young men who have been shot prior to them coming on. We have one young man who was just shot nine times. So, uh, Mr. Hicks and I spoke to just this afternoon. He's in a hospital trying to recover, was shot nine times just about three weeks ago. Could have lost his life. We're so happy that he's alive and well and uh, going through therapy. And one of the questions that I ask is, how are you feeling now? And do you think you're ready now? Because this is a young man that was really struggling. He was struggling with drugs. He was struggling with, um, with uh, uh, the gang life, the street life and with his social media. A lot of these guys are rappers. They post that um, their, their music online. Uh, it can have really negative information or they could be uh, beefing with each other through rap. Uh, these are things that trigger individuals that cause them to go into conflict. Someone says something negative to me about me on social media, I'm gonna get that person. And so um, we try to get the guys to rebrand to re themselves and their social media. Uh, as we try to get them ready to work in a legal economy, we don't want those types of things posted on their social media. Mr. Hicks, there's a question about how do you not sort of scare guys away? And I, you know, guys come to us, they're cynical, they've been lied to, they don't quite believe it, you know, lot, lots of you know, concerns that you know, we're selling false hope or false promises. What do you do to keep guys you know, in the fold? How do you build relationships? with guys that all their life, people have let them down. Simply do as you say and mean what you say. Um, it, it, it uncut. Uh, don't don't say you're going to do nothing when you can't do it. Don't promise anything. Um, again, it, it, it boils down to being authentic, right? So so I, I remember hearing you talk about the LTO, which is license to operate. Just refresh people's memory on that, right? Your license to operate comes to your credibility. Your, your street street cred, what people know you as, right? If you've been a phony individual, of course, people are not going to believe in you. But um, for the most part, to keep guys out there is to stick to the model, right? The model is outreach, engagement, right? So you stand, so, so me as a life coach, even though I go out with outreach, I don't overstep my boundaries. I don't try to life coach immediately, right? I'm going to build a relationship through the outreach worker as he building his, and then they'll say, well, oh, man, for the last two, three months, I've been talking to you already. You have to build a firm relationship, not overstep your boundaries, and always be a listener inst instead of more of a talker. And, that, and that's, that's what worked for me for the last four-plus years. Um, and again, like I say, it's not hard. It's not easy either, right? But at the end of the day, one thing you have to understand is, as a coach, I can't give up, right? And last but not least, right, you lead by example. 
So just to let people know, you check the background, you say, okay, yeah, he's been locked up this time. I just enrolled in Southern New Hampshire University, right, to take on criminology. And I didn't want to throw this out there. But I'm just going to let people know, just because you see me and you hear my past story, just be prepared for the present story and the future story, right? Don't judge a book by its cover. And that's what I'm dealing with. And that's why I love dealing with it. Because I'm a game changer and I'm going to make sure they change the game as well. Well, once you get through Southern New Hampshire, we're so proud of you doing that. Um, yes. Here at school, getting the master's there would be an amazing next step. And uh, our buddy, buddy uh, Steve Gates has some uh, uh, you know, connections with, you, with the university and has gone through. So um, that'd be an amazing thing to think about. Uh, fi final, well, one quick clarifying question or quite a clarifying answer. People sort of asked about our metrics. You know, I talk about six times more violent than New York or three, three times more violent than LA. That's homicides per citizen. So our metrics are very simple, unfortunately. It's just homicides and shootings. That's all we measure. And so you know, we measure it, you know, co you know, constantly, uh, citywide, by community, you know, by block. We didn't get into some of the intricacies of what we do with outreach or we actually position what we call flip workers at the hottest spots in the hottest neighborhoods. And Mr. Hicks talks about the level of, uh, of danger that people undertake um, that's even another level of danger. And we are putting people in war zones on the front lines unarmed and just their, their willingness to do this. I, I can't you know, say more about how much we appreciate the courage and the leadership, what they've done to reduce violence in those hot spots. But we just have you know, a couple quick minutes left. If you guys just sort of come up a notch and you know, you know, say you were the mayor or the governor, if we're trying to get you know, cities up 51%, Rosen's down 33%. If we were trying to get the city to the kinds of reductions that we have to do of Rosen even more than that, I'll start with you, Mrs. Jones and Mr. Hicks, the same question. What does the city, what does the state have to do if you guys are mayor or governor, what we do to try and take to scale the lessons we're learning in Rosen? What does that look like across the other 15, the other 14 most violent neighborhoods? Um. I, you know, I think I would probably scale up social services and community uh, development, uh, more funding in those underserved communities, um, definitely more community-based mediation teams. Uh, the outreach workers, I believe, are, have been phenomenal in terms of uh, reducing violence in Roseland alone, and I and I think that we should use that as a, a as a map and a model and uh, have more of those uh, groups that are, are, are trying to reduce violence across the city and in, in, in the, in the uh, community. And the other thing is uh, to be more transparent. I think that the public uh, needs to know uh, the police uh, record, uh, police officers' records. They need to be transparent. They need to be uh, accessible to the public. And um, we need to just really overall just in uh, police involvement in mental health issues in communities. I don't think that they need to deal with that. Um, that would be some of the places that I would start. Mr. Hicks, same, same question for you. If you were mayor now, what would you be doing? Um, if I was the mayor, I'd be a, 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 a lot more attentive to these programs that, that, that seems to work, right? Um, I invest, right? After I do my homework, I invest. And I also go to some of these neighborhoods, uh, whether it's, it's, it's West Inglewood, Inglewood, um, Lawndale, um, things where, where it seemed, places where it seems like it's not working and invest in, 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 let's be clear about what I'm saying. Let's invest in some of these older people, right? These older, whether they ex-gang members or they street knowledgeable, whatever it is, I just see that's what's worked in roles. I'm, I'm gonna give you my telescope, my lens. What worked in Rosen, we have a lot of guys that have formerly been involved that are out here on these streets every day. And, and to me, from the inside, looking inside looks great. So imagine what it looks like from the outside looking in. You say, well, man, these guys, at, at some point, sometimes we have got guys that's walking down the block, you can count 120 years of penitentiary time within four or five individuals, right? So these, these guys already didn't lost. All they're trying to do is win. And, and what people need to understand, do a winning formula only takes a little knowledge and understanding and you to get to understand what's really going on, get a little insight on it and help invest, right? Only, only we can help us, right? Nobody can help us but us. And when we know where the violence is, we attack it. And I, and I just, whether it's the mayor, chief of police, whatever it is, um, 
I don't know how their job criteria go, but I'm what I'm saying out of my mouth, if you can just be knowledgeable, right? Instead of in a hurry to make an action about what you think is going on, be knowledgeable <laughs> and give guys a chance to, to have a re-entry or to be redirected or, or, or to be shown some self-differentiation as, as opposed to locking them up immediately, um, I think we'll be better off out here. Arnie, can I just say one more thing? We talk a lot about early intervention with younger children. I mean, we put a lot of money into that, but early intervention is also working with young, young men uh, before they leave high school. We need to be working with uh, boys and girls in the school at the elementary level. I would recommend even starting at the fourth grade level. Again, building those protective factors early so that they're uh, already connected by the time they get into high school. They already have people that they're looking up to and they're the right people. I wanna thank everybody for their really thoughtful questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to enough of them. We tried to do the best we can. These are conversations that always could go on for for hours, I, and just the final thought is that Mrs. Jones is extraordinary. Her team is extraordinary. Mr. Hick is extraordinary. But I'll be really clear, um, they are not unique. They're amazing people all over the city, deeply rooted in community, committed to making things better. And if we can listen to them, if we can walk with them, if we can empower them to have the kind of impact that they can have, um, that's the only way I know how to get to a better place. And this is a dark time, it's a difficult time, but I've honestly never been more hopeful. Um, I don't think we can arrest our way out of this problem. I don't think we can incarcerate our way out of this problem. I think we gotta give young men and young women a chance to do something very different. And if we do that, and if we started to do that at scale as a city, um, we would see wildly, wildly different outcomes. And so in a really difficult time, Mr. Hicks and Mrs. Jones, I thank you for your heart. I thank you for your passion. I thank you for your commitment. And I thank you for what you're doing every day, literally to save the lives of our young men and make your home, your home of Rosen, a safer place. Thanks so much. Thank you, Arnie. Thank you as well. Thank you very much. And thank you, University of Illinois. Thanks Chicago. everyone. Love you. Peace. <laughs> Good night.